The Patia City Expats Club is a non-profit social organisation and our speakers are volunteers. The club as such assumes no responsibility or liability for the professional reputation of or the quality of services provided by the speaker today. I was there and I, I don't believe it. I think that's a great title for a, an autobiography. I could say that about my life. Right. Okay, Dr. Andy. Greetings, good morning, and welcome to all. So this morning you don't get the story of my life, you get monkeypox. You get it today because I suspect by Thursday the World Health Organization will have changed the name. We'll no longer be allowed to call it monkeypox because it's considered derogatory. Move to the next slide. Okay, so monkeypox, are we talking about a panic, a pandemic, or is it just Pandora's box? That's one. Okay. Okay. Uh, I'm afraid I have to start with the usual disclaimer. The views expressed here are my views. They do not necessarily represent that of any of the organizations, foundations, or bodies with which I have been associated, taken money from, or otherwise extracted favors about them. Indeed, I would happily see many of them closed down. It's general background information about monkeypox. You must not take it as clinical advice. You must not take a piece from this and say, I don't need to do this or I must do that. You must always consult a licensed clinical physician for any of your needs. It is not a substitute. Always go to a correct physician. Let's see if we can get this to work. Can you advance the next slide, please? Okay. Okay, I do not practice clinical medicine in Thailand. I do not give individual medical clinical advice. If you're ill, go and see a real doctor. I'm far too old to be doing that sort of thing now. I have taken money from lots of organizations. Basically, if they couldn't run away fast enough, I extracted funding from them, from United Nations, World Health, especially CRO, the Southeast Asian Regional Office, and the Goan Global Outbreak and Alert Response Network. So understand that I am partial because I have received funding from those organizations. I say I'm partial, I would happily see most of them closed down, so I'm not probably that partial. Most of this information is not my work. It is public knowledge, it is out there in the public domain. I am not professing, it's mine. I have given the internet URL addresses wherever possible. Okay? And you'll see the main links on the screen and they're interactive when you get the slide deck. Sorry, I'm onto acknowledgements. Yep. Okay, then let's change again, please. Next, please, yep. Okay, so how does this old fart know about monkeypox, huh? Good God, he's in his mid-70s. What can he know about this brand new disease just come to the world? Well, first off, it's not brand new. And it is just one more of the many diseases in the area where I work, which is neglected tropical diseases. NTD. I've seen monkeypox in Africa and I hope I never see it again. And some of the slides we'll be showing you are of children with monkeypox. For the sensitive it can be a little distressing. For this age group probably not. Many of you will have seen or even had measles. It will have been covered in red spots. You didn't find that particularly distressing then. I doubt you will now. But for younger people perhaps it will be so. It's a neglected tropical disease. That's how I know about it. It's one of the 27 
neglected tropical diseases. Next slide, please. Just to make sure, everyone associated with World Health has had to requalify. So I have recently requalified in monkeypox, just like every other clinician and person that's involved in neglected tropical diseases. In May and this month, we all had to do the online training courses and get certified all over again in all aspects of monkeypox. So I really do have some idea what I'm talking about. Okay. Next slide, please. Ageism in your favor. So if you're under 50, pay attention because you are susceptible to monkeypox. Yeah. And if you're over 50, about 85% of you are already protected against monkeypox because you will have had the smallpox vaccination as a child. The problem is, I don't know, and nobody else knows, which 15% of you are not protected. So you better pay attention as well. Because you might be protected, and you might not be. Okay. Next slide, please. Is monkeypox a panic? No, don't panic. It's not a COVID-sized threat. There's lots of misinformation. There's lots of hype going on about it. It's a new situation for the West, for high-income countries. They've not seen much of it before. There's quite a lot because it's mutated, that's new, but there's no massive concern here. It is not COVID-2. It is not a pandemic. It's not likely to become a pandemic. There are new aspects to it. And we're going to have to learn those aspects. And they might catch us off guard. But it's not a massive threat to the world. Next slide, please. Unfortunately, there is a mass of misinformation about monkeypox. And regrettably, China and Russia in particular appear to be flooding the market with lots of misinformation about monkeypox. Do take care. There's a lot of absolute rubbish out there. Monkeypox is not a bioweapon. I'll explain its origins a little bit later. It is not connected with COVID, although COVID may have influenced the outbreak. There's no clinical connection between COVID vaccinations and monkeypox. There's no clinical connection between COVID and monkeypox. There is an impact of COVID on the monkeypox outbreak, which I will explain. But beware, lots and lots of total misinformation about monkeypox. Try and go to reliable sources. Next slide, please. Panic buying? No. You do not need to rush out and buy toilet paper and spaghetti again. I don't think you ever did, but you certainly don't need to for monkeypox. Okay. Price of spaghetti is already quite high enough with that up in the market. People have been a bit concerned because the USA had a stockpile of monkeypox vaccine before the outbreak. Well, in fact, the USA has got lots of stockpiles of vaccine. They keep it for the US military. Monkeypox has been around a long time. If they ever had to deploy to Central Africa, they would need to vaccinate all the troops. And they have lots of different vaccines all stored up in the States. Meanwhile, Europe, as usual, is scrambling to buy up the vaccine that's available. Prices have rocketed. There's a massive shortage. There's very little available. It's not a pandemic. Don't get swept up in the panic. It's not that serious. It's not that widespread. Look through the media hype to get to the reality. Uh, next slide, please. So what is this monkeypox? It is an awful pox virus. The word pox is used generally for many things but it's used clinically to describe this virus. It's an awful pox virus. It's the same family as smallpox. Okay? It is not related to chickenpox. Okay? So it's smallpox, monkeypox, cowpox are in the same family. 
It's called monkeypox because it was first identified in monkeys in the 1950s. It was identified in humans for 1970s. It's not a new disease. Yeah? It's been around a long time. Yeah? I have seen it in Africa in the 80s and 90s. Okay. Right now I've said a thousand Today it's up over 2,000 cases have been reported. The main point is it's spreading outside its traditional areas. It's been confined to West and Central Africa. Now it's appearing in high-income countries in North America, Europe, a little bit in Australia. Next slide, please. There are two main types of monkeypox called clades. We can call them variations, if you the Central African clade is more serious. It's got a higher death rate, makes people more ill. Death rate is about 11%, and that's mainly in the young and the old. Okay. The West African clade is not as serious. Death rate is around 6%, again, in the young and the old. Okay. All the cases found in the high-income countries are from the West African clade. We have not yet found any of the Central African clades in the high-income countries outside the West Central Africa region. Okay. Doesn't mean they're not there, but we haven't found them yet. So the type that's spreading is not the more serious type. It is the West African clade. Next slide, please. Where does it come from? We start with the geography. It's in West and Central Africa. And since the 70s, it's been pretty much confined to those regions with the odd case in the UK, in Europe, the odd case in North America from travelers who were pre-infected. Two or three cases around that level, but the vast majority has been in that region. Okay. What's changed now is it's spreading outside. Next slide, please. Where does it come from? Source, it comes from jungle animals. In particular, the rope squirrel. We don't know for certain the full range of animals that can transmit the disease because it's a neglected tropical disease and it's neglected. There's been very little research on it. It's only white-haired old professors that labor long in the night to try and do anything about it. It's transmitted by eating what they call bush meat, jungle animals, or by contact with the urine or feces or body products. Unfortunately, when you kill a squirrel, the first thing is it does is urinate and defecate all over you. That will transmit the disease. Eating it just adds to the party. Next slide, please. Lots of different animals have been identified. There's probably a lot more that are host to the disease. These are only some that we know about. Yeah? And they all live in the forests in West and Central Africa. So although it's called monkeypox, it's in a wide range of animals. Yes, some monkeys do have it, but it's not limited to monkeys. A huge range of mammals carry the disease. Next slide, please. It can be transmitted human to human with close contact. It can be respiratory, it can be in droplets, sneezed or coughed, or more commonly in skin to skin contact. Any contact with body fluids, okay, particularly along mucous membranes, so eyes, mouth, nose. Okay. It's not clear how the outbreak in the high-income countries, where it came from, possibly Nigeria, nobody knows for sure. No one's been able to trace ground zero case. We don't know how it got into the West. Probably multiple sources, not a single case made it happen. The point is, it is a high rate of infection. It's transmitted very easily on skin-to-skin -skin and body fluid contact. Next slide, please. There's been a lot of talk about monkeypox with 
MSN, men who have sex with men. Monkeypox is not sexually transmitted. It's transmitted by skin-to-skin -skin contact, which does normally occur during sex. The point is you don't need to have sex for that to occur. So using a condom won't work unless you're going to follow in the movie Naked Gun and use the whole body condom for your sexual activities. We may have to modify that statement. Just in the last few days, traces of the virus have been found in semen. Before, only fragments of the virus were found in semen. They were not viable to transmit the disease. Now the whole virus has been found in semen. We may have to modify the statement about sexual transmission. It's not yet clear. So maybe this new variant of the disease can be transmitted. The overall consensus at this time is probably not. But that remains to be seen. There's a, a lot of overemphasis about it being related to men who have sex with men. And indeed, most cases have been reported from that part of the community. But bear in mind, our health services, especially in Europe, and especially in the UK, are skewed. If you want to see a doctor now, you probably wait a month for an appointment. Where is the only place that's got a walk-in clinic? It's the sexually transmitted infection clinic. It's the only clinic left in the whole of Europe where you can walk through the door. What we used to call the clap clinics, sometimes called the GUI, genitary urinary infection clinics. They're the only place left where you can walk through the door and get immediate treatment. So it's not surprising that we're getting most cases reported from the sexually transmitted infection clinics. It may well be that there's an element of men who have sex with men in the equation. But right now, we can't tell. There's not enough cases, and it's skewed because getting access to medical treatment in Europe is now a problem. It's difficult to get an immediate consultation. You've got a sudden rash on your body. What are you going to do? go straight into the sexually transmitted infection clinic where they might probably tell you it's herpes. And if you're not lucky, it's monkeypox. Next slide, please. So two routes of transmission via animals, which we call the primary infection route, and then human to human, which we call the secondary infection route. And unfortunately, mothers can also transfer it to the unborn child, the fetus. So it can cross the placenta barrier. So you can get births of infants with monkeypox. Next slide, please. Modes of transmission. Cough, sneezes, that's droplets in the air, so an ordinary mask will filter it quite well. Lesion, that is from the body, and I'll explain a little bit more about the spots and the fluids that you get. Any of the body fluids, surfaces that have been touched contaminated can enter through breathing through the eyes especially so shields are necessary when treating patients and broken skin animal bites so if you're in the forest again it can be transmitted by bites the virus appears to have mutated you're not quite sure how it's happened but what we're seeing is more mutations so generally, monkeypox has been mutating at the rate of two to four mutations per year. This year, it appears to have gone through 47 mutations. I'm not really sure why that's the case, but it's mutating a lot more and a lot quicker than it has in the past, and that's probably why we're getting the outbreak now. Next slide, please. Well, all this about monkeypox, it's all scaremongering, isn't it? It's not really that serious. The, the death rates are very old. It's only the very young and the very old have got to worry about anything. I said no deaths have been reported. In fact, one was reported yesterday. 2,000 cases now and one death reported, and that was probably linked with comorbidities. So 
that there were other underlying health conditions as well. But it's not all that serious. Most people are going to recover. There's no actual treatment for monkeypox. You just leave it alone and it gets better. I'm going to show you some photographs now because we've forgotten. And we've forgotten the emotional element. In all the clinical aspects of it, we say, well, that's absolutely true. Majority of the patients will recover. We call it a self-limiting disease. It burns itself out. About 14 days, three weeks, it's gone away. Just like measles, when you were a kid, we've forgotten how it looks on children. We've forgotten our emotional reaction when we see our children like that. And when as a parent or a grandparent, you react, the child reacts to your emotion as well. So here's how it looks. This is monkeypox on a child. So if it's your child with the face covered in pus-filled blisters and the whole of the body covered in pus-filled blisters, you might have a different opinion about how serious it is. Yes, it will go away. In the majority of cases, the child will recover. But seeing a child in this state is not always easy to cope with for many parents. The interval from infection to onset is variable between 6 and 13 days. It can be as high as 21 days. We don't really understand why it's so variable, but it can be. It may be that it has to overwhelm the body's immune system first. So with a strong immune system, it takes time to overwhelm it. Next slide, please. So the infection process is in two parts. We've got the invasion period, where you've got a fever and a headache. You might think you've got a bit of cold. Perhaps you think you've got dengue fever in Thailand. You get swelling of the lymph nodes, particularly in the neck and under the armpits, back pain, generally feeling not very well. And then the rash appears, typically on the face. A particular characteristic of monkeypox is you get the rash on the palms of the hands and the soles of the feet. That's almost unique. Very few of the diseases erupt in those places. So if you've got an unexplained case right now, the screening program is to screen for temperature, to screen for flu-like symptoms, particularly swelling of the lymph nodes, and then look at doing diagnostic testing for monkeypox. Next slide, please. Unfortunately, the rash goes through different stages. It starts off as what we call macules. That's rather flat, just raised lumps on the skin, then goes to papules. They become a little hard, then it gets nasty. It goes to blisters filled with clear fluid, almost like a burn blister or a friction blister that you might get from your shoes rubbing. And then the blisters fill with yellow pus. Now it gets nasty. It bursts open. So you, what we call the wet and sticky stage, the body's covered in this fluid, and it then forms a crust and a scab over the blisters, and then it heals. It can take about three weeks for those crusts to fall off and fall away, and then the disease is over. Unfortunately, it can be inside the mouth, making it impossible for the children to eat. Then you have to use intravenous feeding. It can be around the genitalia, which is exceedingly worrying and painful. Okay? It can be around all the mucous membranes inside the nose and so on. So it can be distressing. Very few people are likely to die of it, it's really the emotional impact of the disease rather than the clinical severity. Being covered in yellow separating pus spots is not a very nice thing to have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're not going to die, you are going to recover, but the emotional content is high and we need to factor in that emotional content amongst all the clinical information that's being given as well. Next slide, please. Lesions are cover the entire body, typically. It's everywhere. It's not like other diseases where they're in specific parts of the body. These swollen nymph 
Lymph nodes can be very painful, particularly around the neck and the armpits. It's around three to four weeks. It's more common in children. There is a risk of post-infection scarring. It's believed, and again, we don't have a lot of research because it's a neglected tropical disease. It's believed the monkeypox itself does not cause the scarring. The blisters will form crust, the crust will fall off, there won't be any scarring. But during the wet and sticky stage, it's possible to get secondary bacterial infections. So it's important to keep the patient very clean during this time. If they get a secondary infection, this can cause scarring. And similar to smallpox, you see the faces, scar facial scarring from the disease. So it's important to keep on top of cleanliness throughout the illness to prevent that secondary infection causing skin scarring. Next slide, please. It's exceedingly difficult to diagnose monkeypox because it looks like lots of other diseases, particularly in the early stages. It looks very similar to chickenpox, to measles, not likely to be smallpox because it's largely eradicated, but it could be herpes, could be scabies even. Most clinicians will have never seen a case of monkeypox ever in their life. So it's not easy to diagnose. High fever and a rash, well, it could be lots of things. A particular giveaway is the blisters on the palms of the hands and the soles of the feet. That is almost unique to monkeypox. Next slide, please. So it's very difficult to tell the diseases apart in the early stages. Here in Thailand, you heard a report that they found three cases which turned out to be herpes. I can't blame the clinicians at all. It's very difficult to tell in the early stages. So lab testing is important. We need that diagnostic, especially in the early stages of the disease. Monkeypox is not related to chickenpox, but it can look the same in the early stages. Right now, few physicians will have seen a case of measles in their life. It's largely gone. In the south of Thailand, we have a fair amount of measles but the rest of the country, it's largely eradicated. You might go 30 years in a career and never see a case. So again, it can be hard to tell monkeypox from measles in the early stage. Next slide, please. So lab testing is necessary and it has to be PCR. Fortunately, we have a lot of PCR equipment around from COVID. <laughs> So we've got the equipment, what we need is the test kits for monkeypox. Antigen testing is not specific for monkeypox at present. That's the rapid test kits that you get. It detects all orthopox viruses, not just monkeypox, so we can't use that yet. They're rushing and working on a version that might be possible, but it's not there yet. So it has to be PCR testing in a laboratory. And the samples have to be handled with care because they're highly infectious. Point about monkeypox is it might not be particularly serious, but it's highly infectious. It spreads very rapidly on body contact. Next slide, please. Treatment for monkeypox is largely supportive. Paracetamol to bring down the fever, lots of fluids. There is a vaccine available for monkeypox, but it is an exceedingly short supply. And once again, the Europeans have bought up every bit of scrap of supply that's available, so we're not likely to be getting any in Thailand anytime soon. However, smallpox vaccine can give a degree of protection against monkeypox, about 85%, and some countries are using smallpox vaccine. There is a specific treatment for monkeypox, but again, it's not likely to be available. It's in very limited quantities, and it's very expensive. So mainly, it's just supporting the patient, keeping them clean and isolated during the stage until the crusts are formed, the scabs are formed, and they start to fall off. Next slide, please. 
Why is this happening now? Why are we getting this outbreak now? And it's really the classic storm of lots of factors coming together. Deforestation in Africa is driving the animals out of the forest, more contact with people. Central Africa is in the middle of all manner of civil unrest, gross poverty, there's wars being fought all over the place. The role of climate change is not clear, but there's probably a contributing factor around that as well. And also partly because we stopped doing smallpox vaccine. See, the smallpox vaccination protected people against monkeypox. We didn't really appreciate that at the time, we do now, but when we stopped the smallpox vaccinations, monkeypox started to rise. So it's this combination of all these factors coming together which is driving the outbreaks that we're seeing now. We should have seen it coming. Monkeypox has been on the rise for years. It's not a new disease. White-haired old professors have been singing this song to people who don't pay any attention for a long time. Next slide, please. Just say a word about the smallpox vaccination. If you've got a small scar on your upper left arm, looking a little bit like this, then you've probably had the smallpox vaccination as a child. Okay. Most people during the 60s and 80s were vaccinated. You can wait till later to check your arm. <laughs> You're probably about 85% protected against monkeypox because you've had the smallpox vaccination. Which 15% are not protected? I don't know. Okay. Why now? Well, because it's been... Sorry, next slide, please. It's been increasing... We've been warning for 10 years. It's on the rise. You're gonna have an outbreak. Nobody wants to put any money in. Nobody wants to do anything around neglected tropical diseases. We're seeing increasing cases in the West. Yeah. But again, nobody wants to listen to neglected tropical diseases. That's why we call them neglected. It's not a new disease. COVID was a new disease. This isn't. Next slide, please. But let's be clear, it's not a pandemic. It's not likely to become a pandemic. We look at the reports. It is containable, isolation, and most people will recover from it. It might be emotionally challenging to go through the disease, but the majority of people will recover from it. And we can probably contain it. It's not yet that serious. There's about 2,000 cases worldwide reported. Next slide, please. If you look at countries reporting the disease, we can see it's pretty widespread. It's moving around the world. But again, 2,000 cases around the world. Not that many. And it tends to be concentrated in just a few countries, largely in Europe. Next slide, please. I don't know if you can read this, but you can see some of the larger countries. Okay, if you look down the list, Spain here, 198. Yeah. Italy, 29. Finland, 68. Most countries, look, one, two, three, four, not much there. Just concentrated in a few countries with the UK at 300, topping the list. Okay, so it's not that big. It is not a pandemic. It is an outbreak. Next slide, please. Why have we got here? Because neglected tropical diseases are neglected. Tomorrow, the World Health Organization will vote on the Kigali Declaration on Neglected Tropical Diseases which basically says it would be a really good idea if we paid some attention to them. Here in Thailand, white-haired old professors have been working on putting this together for years, along with Makedon University, 
because we have neglected tropical diseases in Thailand too, like dengue, like Japanese encephalitis. Yeah. And we're trying to put together to actually get some attention paid to these diseases. Next slide, please. So the point about neglected tropical diseases is around the world, one person in seven suffers from them. So if we don't pay attention to them, they're going to come back and bite us in the bum, just like monkeypox. Yeah? We've neglected it, we've seen it rising, we did nothing about it, and now, surprise, we've got an outbreak. And that's going to keep happening until we pay some attention to neglected tropical diseases. Next slide, please. So what we've got waiting for us around the world is a Pandora's box. We've got huge deforestation, driving animals out, bringing disease with them. We've got conflict zones churning everything up, mixing people around, internally displaced persons moving around, transmitting disease. We've got transmission from animals to humans of all kinds of diseases which previously weren't that prevalent in humans. We've got climate change added into this as well. It's a Pandora's box waiting to explode of neglected tropical diseases of all the ills in the world. Next slide, please. And COVID has made it a bit worse. There is no connection between COVID and malaria. But the rate of malaria has increased, the rate of deaths have increased, because due to all the lockdowns on COVID, we couldn't get the medicines and the insecticides and the bed nets through to the areas to protect people against malaria. Because of all the lockdowns, all the people spraying, all the people controlling the disease had to stay at home. So we're seeing an increase in diseases it's no clinical connection to COVID, but the impact of the disruption caused by COVID has been an increase in neglected tropical diseases. Around 30% of the medical stores in Africa are out of stock of around 20 essential medicines because all the international transport's been disrupted. Most of the medicines are made in India. Well, India's open again now, but India gets the raw materials, what we call the API, the active pharmaceutical ingredient, to make the medicines from China. And guess where in China makes these medicines? A city called Wuhan. So the lockdowns disrupted the entire supply of world medicines. It's not clinical COVID, that's the impact of COVID on that. And we're seeing that on the neglected tropical diseases, and that's probably why we've got the monkeypox outbreak. Now, we've restricted activities to control neglected tropical diseases, and we're seeing that impact on malaria and on typhoid and on other diseases in the region. Next slide, please. Well, what about the next pandemic? Where's that coming from? Well, it's bound to happen it's not going to be Ebola. Ebola is too lethal. It kills people before it can spread, so it burns itself out. It's more likely to be something like an avian influenza transmitted from animals. We've got to be better prepared for that. And that means addressing basic health care needs. Going back to basics. Looking at controlling disease in the countries where it's prevalent. Next slide, please. So the future pandemic, if we look at the past, well, we've had all manner of diseases transferred from animals. The next one is likely to come from animals as well, most likely going to be a kind of bird flu because of all the intensive livestock farming that we're doing. If we look at the typical situation of a duck pond next to a pig farm, you couldn't invent a better virus breeder. If you wanted to make a farm to manufacture viruses, you couldn't do better than have waterfowl and chickens next to pigs, next to humans. It's ideal transmission. And with that kind of intensive livestock farming, it's inevitable that there's going to be 
another zoonotic disease emerging. Next slide, please. At the same time, the high-income countries are not helping. The serious cutbacks in aid, especially for medicine, at a time when neglected tropical diseases are on the increase, is insanity. And yet all the major aid programs have cut back on health. The health spending is actually a small proportion of what countries spend anyway. Majority is country self-funding. And of the money that is available for health, more than 50% goes for HIV AIDS control. So, as I've said before, in neglected tropical diseases, we're saving up for a down payment on a new test tube. Cutting back makes no sense in these circumstances. We're making a perfect storm. We've got deforestation, we've got civil unrest and movement of people, and we've got cutbacks in health activities. Next slide, please. However, just like Pandora's box, we've got the angel of hope coming along. The angel of hope is new vaccine technology. We have got a vaccine for monkeypox. It's not that great, it's not particularly effective, but it does work and we could gear up production relatively easily if we need to. At this time, we on WHO is not recommending mass vaccination for monkeypox. It's just recommending what we call ring vaccination. So when you find a case, you will vaccinate people all around it, but only in that area. It's not recommended for mass vaccination, and we don't have the vaccine anyway. And that's not likely to change. It will continue as ring vaccination. So we have hope for the future. It's not all doom and gloom, although I've painted a pretty sad picture of deforestation and climate change mixing it together. We have hope of being able to cope with some of the new diseases. Next slide, please. Just a few messages then. You don't need conspiracy theories to explain monkeypox. It's not a new disease. It's been increasing for 10 years. All you need to explain it is poverty and neglect and environmental factors. And if we started addressing basic health issues in low-income countries, we'd probably find we got a lot less disease outbreaks in the high-income countries. Next slide, please. Okay, that's me done. Any questions? Professor, is there any danger with all the soy dogs running around and all these squirrels that we see all, all, all over? the place and people will touch them or try and feed them and have contact with them. Uh, okay, I think the biggest danger from soy dogs is of course rabies. Um, can dogs transmit monkeypox? Yes, there is a case in the US of transmission from dogs. Dogs don't appear to be susceptible to the disease, but it's possible they can transmit it. The squirrels around, probably in Thailand, the density is not enough so they would get monkeypox and die and not be able to transmit the disease. So that's unlikely, it's a possibility, but highly unlikely. The biggest problem from soy dogs is that they're aggressive. Once they're together in packs, there's really very little you can do. So in days gone by, Patia Banglamong used to have a dog catcher on the council payroll who would clear out soy dogs and take them to the temple. That appears to have stopped. I think that needs to come back. Once they're in a pack, it's very difficult to do anything. There is a risk of rabies. Rabies appears to be stable in Thailand. It's not on the rise, but one of the hot spots for rabies is actually Chomburi province. So if you're not up to date on rabies vaccinations, it might be a good thing to do. Hi, um, you, you mentioned ring vaccinations. Yep. When there's a cluster, in a place, how big is the cluster normally? It depends on the country. Most clusters are two or three cases within the family. It tends to be a child and then mother, father. 
So usually ring vaccination is about 30, 50 people. And if you don't have monkeypox vaccine, they're using smallpox vaccine because they have lots of it frozen in the store from 20 odd years ago. Well, <coughs> firstly, Dr. Andy, that was just yet another absolutely brilliant talk. Um, thank you so much. I just wanted uh, to ask, uh, I have any number of questions, but um, in terms of older people, you know, uh, we mentioned the fact of possibility of getting a shingles vaccine, and uh, there's a new generation of that coming. Is that something you'd recommend older people to think about? Yes, anyone over 50, I would recommend seriously considering shingles vaccination. The key question is, did you have chicken pox as a child? And for the vast majority of people, the answer will be yes in this age group. If you've had chicken pox, there's a danger of you developing shingles. So basically, the chicken pox virus, varicella, never leaves the body. It lives on nerve endings. And when your immune system becomes depressed, it will break out as shingles. You can't remove it from the body, but the shingles vaccination will control it, will prevent it. And you can get multiple episodes of shingles. The new shingles vaccine, when it becomes available, is a lot better and it's slightly cheaper. Shingles vaccination is expensive in Thailand. It's about eight, 10,000 baht. But I'd still say it's worth thinking about for over 50s. If you've ever met someone with shingles, they'll tell you just how painful it is. Well, I want to make a comment. I had the shingles vaccine sometime back, and I got shingles. <laughs> it is not perfect. No, it isn't. No but vaccine. it is recommended to get it because I know others, my friends, that have gotten the shingles. They don't have the vaccine, but they've had no problem. Unfortunately, I'm one of those that did catch it, and I will reiterate, it's hell, and it lasts a while, and just, well, never mind. You're right, it's hell on earth. Yes, apparently the new shingles vaccine is much better. It Definitely. is much better. No vaccine is 100%. Remember that for your COVID vaccinations as well. They're not 100%, about 95, 90%, uh, and immunity does wane with time. Yes, well, when, when the new shingles vaccine becomes available, the club will look at the possibility of, you know, having, a, having it available in the club as a special event, like we do with flu vaccines, subject to the committee's approval. I just wondered if you'd be game to say a, a few words about how you think the performance of WHO has been, World Health Organization has been in the COVID period. <laughs> we, we, we'll cut it out of the video. <laughs> Something of a conflict of interest because I am speaking on WHO webinars and receiving funding from WHO sources. I would happily see the organization close down. The world needs a global health organization. WHO have demonstrated over many years they're incapable of doing that. There are many reasons for that, which will take me another four hours to explain. Well, a huge round of applause for Dr. Andy on yet another brilliant talk. Well, I can't tell you, it's such an impressive talk and we've got a real picture of global issues involved in these sorts of things. So I have, of course, a certificate of appreciation for Dr. Andy and also for Lloyd. Um, yeah.